This is a Channel 2 News special report. Good morning, I'm Natalie Marmy, and we're beginning Channel 2 News midday a bit early this morning due to the fact that uh, George W. Bush is in town. He has just arrived at the Child Center there at the University of Portland. Uh, when I become the president, I'll set clear priorities for our budget. Priorities to make sure Social Security is safe and secure today, and there's a Social Security system tomorrow. A second priority be make, make sure that Medicare fulfills its promise for the elderly today, and there's a Medicare system around for younger workers tomorrow. A priority which you'll hear about is peace and security in the world. But I believe we can meet our priorities and still have some money left over. And there's a fundamental disagreement about what to do with the money. Our opponents sound like they think the government owns the surplus. I think the surplus is the people's money, and I want to share some of it with the people who pay the bills. And, and as you watch Washington carefully, you see a big difference of opinion about this issue. You see, the senator and I, or the senators and I, and the congressman, believe we can make the tax code more fair. The, the farmers of this country and the farmers and ranchers of your state and the small business people of your state are penalized by the current tax code when it comes to the death tax. In order to make the code fair, we got to get rid of the death tax in America. Recently, recently, the president was given a bill passed out of the House and the Senate that would have eliminated the marriage penalty. Now think about a tax code that punishes marriage and families. And yet my opponent was silent on the subject. And his boss, the President of the United States, vetoed the bill. It is clear they stand on the side of government. We stand on the side of the families in America. I'm running to keep the peace. I want the moms and dads and grandparents to hear this loud and clear. This will be an administration that does everything in our power to make the world a more peaceful place. I can't think of a better legacy, a better legacy for an administration than to say, we kept the peace. We kept ourselves out of war, which requires, however, a realistic view of the world. Oftentimes, it's a big pressure to see the world the way we'd like to see it. Not me, I'm going to see the world the way it is. And the way I see the world is in the post-Cold War era. This is a world of uncertainty. And even though the evil empire may have gone on its way, evil still exists. People, can't res people who resent our freedoms, resent our successes, people who want to threaten our alliances. I will not let our nation retreat inside our borders. This is too important a nation to keep. It's too important a nation to retreat. We must remember it is the obligation of America to help make the world more peaceful as far as I'm concerned. It's an obligation of a commander-in-chief as well to understand in order to keep the peace, we must rebuild the military power of the United States of America. So those are some of the issues, some of the issues that the people of your great state are beginning to hear loud and clear. Issues based upon principles not based upon polls and focus groups. It's issues that come from the heart, not come because of some political consultant says you gotta say it in order to get ahead. These are positions, these are positions from which I will not vary during the course of the campaign. My mission is to earn your confidence, your vote, and be able to stand up in front of Republican and Democrat alike and say, the people of this country have spoken. I come, I come before you as a representative of the will of the American people. Now let's get it done. I one time ran for the United States Congress years ago. And came in second place in a two-man race. After the race was over, a lady walked up to me this is a little town where Laura and I were raised called Midland, Texas. We knew a lot of the folks there. And she walked up and said, hey, I didn't vote for you. I said, oh, really? I'm sorry to hear that. Why not? She said, because you didn't bother to ask for my vote. Let it be said in the great state of Oregon, I'm here asking for the vote. I want your help. I 
I'm here asking for your help. Will you join us in this campaign? Find your friends and neighbors. And should I be fortunate enough to earn your confidence, I'm going to ask for another thing. I'm going to call upon the great, the great strength of our country to make sure the American dream, in fact, touches every willing heart. You see, the great strength of our country lies not in the halls of government. It lies in the hearts and souls of loving, decent, caring citizens. No, the great strength of America takes place oftentimes in spite of government, where a neighbor walks across the street and says, you need a hand, here it is where churches and synagogues and mosques spread that universal call to love a neighbor just like you'd like to be loved yourself. In order to make sure, in order to make sure the American experience reaches its, spreads its wings throughout all our society, I will call upon the greatness of the country. I'll ask people to be mentors, to say to a child, somebody loves you. I think we ought to have a program aimed at helping the sons and daughters of prisoners understand somebody cares. I know we need to say to the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, keep teaching values to our children. Big brothers and big sisters. To the big brothers and big sisters of America, we need to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Remember our society improves one child at a time, one heart, one soul, one conscience at a time. But in order to call upon the best, it requires leadership that understands the responsibilities of the offices to which we have been elected. It requires a leader who will set our sights, raise our sights, and, and lift our spirit. One of the big jobs I'll have is to, is to lift the spirit of the country. And so, in closing, I want to thank you all for coming. I tell you, we want your help. I'm going to work my heart out to earn your confidence and the confidence of our fellow citizens. And should I be elected on that day, should after it's all said and done, the people of this country turn to me and Dick Cheney when I put my hand on the Bible that day in January 2001, I will swear, I will swear to uphold the laws of the land, but I'll also swear to uphold the honor and the integrity of the office to which I have been elected, so help me God. Thank you all for coming. God bless. Thank you all. Thank you all. Texas Governor George Bush, it is visit number four to Oregon for the Republican nominee for President of the United States. The University of Portland now officially estimating this crowd of Republican supporters at 2,500. With me at the Child Center, our political analyst, Tim Himmets. Tim, first of all, your quick take on what we just heard here. Well, a couple of things. First is it's very clear that George Bush is coming trolling for votes in Democratic territory. I think he's going to make a serious effort to win the state of Oregon. No Republican has won it in 16 years presidentially, but it's very clear George Bush thinks he can win and it's going to be here. In this presidential race, Tim, do you win just by showing up in Oregon, or do you really have to work the people here? Well, he's got to work the people to win, and especially since he's swimming a little bit upstream because the state in the last three elections has voted for a Democrat for president, so he's swimming upstream, but clearly they believe they have a chance to win in Oregon or they wouldn't be here. Not too long ago, it looked like the vote in Oregon and Washington might not be that important in the presidential race this year. Has that changed? It has changed in particular. We've got a high-stakes game going on here, John. The fact of the matter is Al Gore has to win Oregon and Washington. George Bush doesn't. So by coming to Oregon and Washington and putting more pressure on Gore, he raises the stakes for Gore to win here. If Gore doesn't win Oregon and Washington, he's not going to be president. So in essence, George Bush is coming on to Al Gore's turf and saying, I'm going to fight you right on your home ground. Let's get down to brass tacks here. Is this here? Because he's here, it's convenient. He was in the neighborhood, so why not drop in? Or do you think the Republicans have really finally said, let's win Oregon? I think they've said we have a chance to win Oregon. Let's come out here and see what we can do. And again, I would include Washington State in that as well. So they're not just here because they're in the neighborhood. They're here because they think they have a chance to win. Any observation about the size of the crowd, about the people who turned out today? Good sized crowd, I think. Uh, one thing that I found very interesting in terms of the setting was that I noticed Governor Bush had uh, almost virtually all women directly behind him on the podium and young, uh, young women as well. And what that tells me is he's also going uh, after a group that has voted Democratic in the presidential elections the last several elections, and that's women. What George Bush is saying is, I'm not going to concede them to you, Al Gore. I'm going to fight for, for the vote of women. 
And looking into your crystal ball, is it likely we will see George Bush back here before Election Day? That all depends on what the numbers look uh, in the middle of September. If George Bush.